So now we have the sum of the external torques. Now let's look at the other side of the equation. Let's look at the time rate of change of the angular momentum. So I'm going to leave the vector notation off and remind you that these are all in or out of the board. Okay, so when it's positive, it's out of the board. When it's negative, it's into the board. Uh, let's see. So our torque that we had was big R, where big R, by the way, is the radius of the disk. I don't see that on here. Uh, big R, M1G. That was the only torque left when we were all done. Big R, M1G. That's equal to the time rate of, cha of change, the rate of change of all the angular momentums. So that's really just you got to get the angular momentum of each mass. One is turning, two are translating. But we know that even something translating has angular momentum relative to some rotation axis, which we still have put right there. OK, well, in each case, for the translating ones, it's just r cross p. Right? It's just this direct distance vector, or this uh, displacement vector, r1 cross p1. That's the translation of mass 1. Uh, this is rotating. It's not translating. And since we put the axis right on the center, we don't need a parallel axis theorem. We can just say it's I2 omega 2. That's its angular momentum. And then, of course, uh, the third one is R3 cross P3, the third one's momentum. And then we know that they're changing in time because the question was, how is this going to accelerate? So the P's are changing, the omega's changing. Um, to move forward, let's note one thing here, or a couple things. Note um, all, let's see, not all the masses. Um, M1 and M3 are at the same V. That's this thing we assume the string isn't stretchable, so they're going to have the same velocity at some instant in time. And uh, they don't slip on the disk and Omega 2 is V over R. So the rope defines the uh, speed of the edge of the disk. So we have that standard relationship that we've talked about uh, before. Okay? So I'm going to use these uh, to rewrite this. All right? So we're going to say big R, M1G, that's the torque, is the time rate of change of, and here we go. Let's see, R1, we're still going to call it R1, R1. Um, M1V, that's P1, they all have the same V, times the sine of theta1. I'm not going to draw the vectors like we did for the torque, but that's this angle we would stick right here, theta1. Uh, plus, um, let's think about what is I of the disk. It's 1 half M2 big R squared. 1 half MR squared is a disk's moment. And omega2 is V over R. Okay, so clearly we can see we can get rid of one of these R's. There we go. And then this one, mass 3, uh, we got its R vector from here to here. Again, we'll make up some theta. We'll call it theta 2. And this will be R2, M2, uh, uh, V, same V, sine theta 2. If you're just jumping into this video and you have no idea what I mean by these angles and where these signs are coming from, you need to watch the previous two where we did a similar thing for the torque. Let's see. So let's look at that now. And let's also note, we're going to do it. We're just going to write it and not draw the geometry. That um, R1, M1, V, sine theta 1 equals what? Equals uh, R1, M1, V. And what is sine theta 1? If I had that triangle drawn nicely here, you can basically see it. There's R1. There's theta. Uh, there's big R. The sign is opposite over hypotenuse, big R over R1. Ah. And there goes your R1s that you don't want to think about. Just did it in terms of big R. It's the same idea as the torque. If we were to take um, this V and draw a dotted line to the axis and say, what's the distance between that axis and this dotted line, the line of the velocity here, it'd be big R. Same idea. And same thing here, R2, M2, V, sine theta 2 is R2 M2 V sine theta 2. Uh, same idea. It's R um, uh, big R over R2. 
is r over r2. And those go away. So then we see that uh, the torque m1g is equal to ddt of basically this big R m1v plus 1 half mrv plus big R m2v. So let's take the time derivative of each one of those. So let's see. Big R is constant. M1 is constant. What's the derivative of the velocity? The acceleration. If the whole system is moving at V, dV dt is A. So this just becomes big R M1A. Right? This term is R M1A. Plus, what does this term become? Constant, constant, constant. D dt makes it A. So it's 1 half um, big R M2A. What does this become? R M2V. V becomes A when you take a time derivative. R M2A. Cancel the big R's. Doesn't matter. All that matters is the mass and how it's distributed, just like we saw when we rolled things down a plane. So now we could actually pull A out of this and solve for it. That's what we're looking for. The acceleration is equal to, it looks like, M1G. I'm going to put the g out here to get a, a ratio, a fraction that's unitless, m1. And on this side, all we're left with is m1 plus a half m2 plus m3. m1 plus a half m2 plus m3. Like that. Oh my god, this has been m3 the whole time. <laughs> 3, 3. Sorry, three, 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 there you go. Three, three, three. Yeah, okay, I think that fixes it. Uh, let's see. So there we have, there's the answer. So this you could have gotten a lot quicker with all this detailed thought of every little vector and every little cross product and every little angle, but I think it was useful to see that at least once. And the answer even makes sense. Why is it M1? Why is it the fraction of m1 over the sum of the masses with a half there? Well, m1 is in the numerator because that's the only one that's driving the motion. Right? The heavier m1 is, the faster it accelerates. And it's a fraction of g because g is the acceleration it wants to go at. The denominator is the mass of the whole thing. And there's a half there because this one isn't translating, it's rotating. Right? So that's just the whole difference between translational and rotational motion. Right? So that's three videos to describe the simplest, most straightforward standard uh, physics problem in this area.